Welcome to the 132nd episode of the Supernatural Occurrence Studies Podcast. So damn paranormal, see? My name is Jason Knight, host of the show, and with me, as always, is... Hmm, that good timer, Oscar Spector. Producer extraordinaire and podcast co-host. Listeners, if you want to skip this intro, please make sure to check the show notes. There'll be a timestamp there waiting for you. Oscar, how have things been over the last two weeks, my friend? Trying to smoke the cigar. No, I'll stop making that voice. It's really annoying. <laughs> I love it. Um, you should do the whole episode in that voice. I actually could if if, uh, if I get enough feedback where people are like, you know, that voice is not so bad. Then tell me so, because in general, Jay's the only one that likes it in my life. <laughs> Everyone's pretty annoyed by it. They're like, I get the reference, but you don't have to make the voice. Everyone's like, oh, God. Listen, I love it. Everyone hates my voice, um, or my character voices. I'm doing good, very well. It is summer today. Uh, it's very weird, very weird day. Um, and but you know, not that weird also because it's Chicago. So whatever. So whatever. Um, otherwise, it's been it's been good. Just like the um, same old stuff, really. Nothing, nothing much to I'm trying to think. Is there a lot to report? There is actually something, but it's kind of personal. But besides that, um. Hmm. I know Lexi and I have been finding more excuses to drink together. Now we're doing it as a couple, though, not as um, loners. So there's that going on. So that's maybe a, a step up. Couples drinking. Yeah. We're just playing more board games lately, which is something I've always been um, not curious about. I've always been um, wanting to do in general with people and whatever. I know COVID, yes. But like still board games. Um, and I've been finally, I've been, I played in the last week like four different board games already. And that's like a huge market up uh, percentage up higher than the month before. So yeah, it's been a little fun that way. Otherwise it's just keeping up with the day-to-day -day stuff and it's been differently weird and differently good and definitely okay. You know, pretty normal stuff. Yeah. Um, nothing major to report. Um, the girls are great. Uh, by the girls, I mean the gliders are wonderful we still have to cut their nails again because they're long and they're sharp and my back is my back looks like a like a road map for ants or something you know it doesn't look very good um from the sugar glider scratching you yeah when oh. they climb on you right they that well they climb so they're like they're using their nails um and sometimes if they spot like something they don't like a mole or like a zit on my back or something they're like suspicious of it and they start biting it so like oh it doesn't hurt I, I mean it hurts like it stings a bit it doesn't hurt <laughs> on my back like it like the way it would hurt other places it doesn't hurt that much um but it's been great they're, they're being they're being kind of cool and uh they're being other than that they're being really lovable and cool um yeah otherwise nothing much how about you you know a lot of the same old kind of just what you said just kind of the same old routine work's busy life's busy the usual um, today was a very warm day. The kids are finally, and yesterday too, we were almost in the 60s and kids are finally getting out and playing. We're, we're easing up a little bit and letting them go with their normal group of friends, running the streets, creating a ruckus. That's awesome. And uh, we're also getting ready for another vacation. We're going back to New Orleans, beginning of April for a week, Wow! bringing the kids there for spring break. And it's going to be awesome. My son will turn eight while we're there. So we're going to have something special out there for him. Oh, and, that's uh, the, the legal drinking age in New Orleans. In New Orleans, is it? It's eight. We got to take him to a strip club. We're going to have a great time. Uh, so we're, the kids are really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. So is Katie. Uh, so we're kind of in getting into vacation mode, getting into that headspace, you know. Count is that why you're working so hard? That's right. I need the money. <laughs> exactly. Right, and right. Uh, this is our, our fiscal, uh, the end of our fiscal year at my company. 
so it, it is it's it's insanely busy and uh trying to make things happen and uh close out the year strong but anyway here we are we're mic'd up ready to go to another brand new episode something a little different this topic as you can see in the title right but my but also by my blank expression i do not exactly know what we're going to talk about no, no. And well, you know what? I'm jumping the gun. We'll get into it. Um, but that's kind of the nice thing of having your own show, isn't it, Oscar? You could talk about whatever the fuck you want. I mean, I'm certainly going to after this uh, double feature you got going on. After ending a previous double feature of the Alaskan Triangle, there's going to be my official double feature coming up. And that's definitely something that only I could come up with, probably. <laughs> Yes, very unique, but right. very interesting. I have the first cut of the first episode of, of your double feature. I can't mm-hmm. wait to listen to it. Uh, it was mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Hard research you did on that one. I do not envy what you had to go through to put that one together, but it was great. It was great. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of weird topics, and it's awesome you could have your own show and talk about whatever the hell you want, our last Patreon episode for mm-hmm. February. Mm-hmm was one that was kind of off the rails for us as well. Um, We talked about video games and arcades. Right. Uh, Old school, primarily old school, some new ager stuff. Like I think the, the thing I did was in the two thousands for sure. It was 2010 or something, but you specifically, you did eighties arcade games. Like you went. Yeah. 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 And of course there was a hook to that, topic right it wasn't just talking about our video games and arcades oh right yeah i mean when we say we could talk about whatever everyone because it's our show yeah but we also mean within the parameters of supernatural or conspiracy or serial killer yeah um, that's what we mean <laughs> exactly but with that episode we couldn't think of a title it was very hard to come up with a title right remember yes. so what i did and I, I promised our patrons that i would do this on the normal feed show um what I did is I created, it was just a lame ass title, right? I, I couldn't think of anything. So I created, I, I, did, I did think of one actually after. What, what, oh, after, what did you come up with? I, I was going to say like, why don't you call it like 8-bit madness? 8-bit madness. Oh, that is good. Right. I do like that. But uh, by then you would have posted it and I didn't know the name of it until yeah. today. So I think what I did, I wound up calling it, uh, literally I called it lame title, insane video games. That's what I called it. Yeah. But what I did is I, coded that title in hex Mm -hmm. and i told our patrons hey the first or the first uh, if you if you decipher the title we'll we'll give you a shout out of the main show so yeah it was really quite funny uh it was like two in the morning when i posted maybe 2 30 when i posted that patreon episode and five minutes later five minutes later one of our patrons got back to me immediately yeah. Uh and he had he had decoded the hex that quickly. So I do want to give a shout out to Jeremy H from Arizona. He was the first person to solve our latest Patreon only podcast episode title. Um I so thank you, Jeremy. I shouldn't be surprised that it took him literally five minutes to to get that. This guy's worked for Google, he's an AI now, really smart cat. So so thank you. And then the following day, I, yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say, and we're and, and plus we're not the Zodiac Killer. We're not good at puzzles and shit. <laughs> yeah. We're not like I make you a cipher that'll take like some school teacher in Pennsylvania to figure out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Well, the next day, uh, another one of our patrons, Luke, uh, got back That's to right. me and, and had deciphered the title. Uh, so thank you guys. There's your shout out. Thank you for your patronage. And uh, we hope you keep you entertained. Now, I was trying to, I spent an insanely long time, Oscar, trying to code that lame ass title in like C or 6502 assembly language. Cause these were the languages that were used in classic Atari 2600 games. I yeah. couldn't figure out how to do it. So I just went with hex. Nice. But thanks guys. Awesome. Um, what else? We have a voicemail, Oscar, that phone number that you poop like in your pocket. No, oh. no, it's in the ether. It's in the ether. Um, are you saying that you actually went to that lo- lonely payphone in Idaho, got the voicemail that you installed, the voice machine, and brought it back to Chicago in order to play it on, on for everyone? Yes. Did you ask me if I installed the voice machine? Yes. That's awesome. Yes, I did. And I did it. Yeah. Uh, so, Oscar, I want to play that now. Yes, my name is Bill. I'm calling from Texas. 
I grew up in Houston in the 1970s and early 1980s. I'm calling in reference to your episode 88 on Dean Coral and the Houston mass murders. Just wanted to give a polite clarification. Uh, Coral never moved to Pasadena, California. He moved to Pasadena, Texas. Pasadena, Texas is a large suburb of Houston. It's in the same county as Houston, Harris County. Um, it's an easy, easy drive. And uh, the last residence he lived at when he was shot to death was in Pasadena, Texas. Uh, he never lived in Pasadena, California. But uh, you had a very good podcast, and I found it very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for the voicemail. We always say, you know, no matter, pretty much no matter what the voicemail is, we'll play it. Uh, obviously, this gentleman is a fan. He's referring to episode 88, the Candyman episode that we did on Dean Coral, that Coral. nasty piece of shit. Uh, but I remember, and, and he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, Dean Coral never was uh, or never moved to or, or did did dirt in Pasadena, California. It was Pasadena, Texas. And I remember this specifically because I figured that out as we were posting the show, like the show had to be out as I figured it out. Do you remember this? And I, like, I remember, yes, I remember the, for some reason, I do remember that bit of the recording. Yes. And, and I freaked out. So we I decided... remember that we corrected it the next episode. I convinced you to like, don't worry about it. We'll just correct it on the next show. Yes. And I believe we did. We did in the beginning of episode 89, I, I made a correction. Um, but thank you to the listener for, uh, for pointing it out. We know it was a mistake in my research. I don't know how I fucked that up, but now my anxiety is coming back. Thank and you. I remember I made fun of you because <laughs> I was like, it's hard to mix up the Pasadena in California from the Pasadena in Texas. I would think because I mean, because when I think of Pasadena, I think of Texas. Oh, I don't. Oh, that's interesting. At all. I never even knew there was a Pasadena, Texas until the Dean hmm. Coral episode. Yeah, maybe it's not as famous worldwide, I guess. Maybe the California one's more famous, right? I guess. I don't know. Maybe. That's yeah. where I went. It yeah, was right. an error in my research. Uh, right. Apologies. Good thing it was in Paris, Texas, and not Paris, France, right? It's that makes true. Up, that, that makes up it's probably a little worse. Or Cairo. <laughs> Cairo, right. Where's, where's Cairo at? Well, Egypt, and then there's Cairo, right. Illinois. Illinois. Isn't there another Cairo somewhere else? In, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. States? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that going on. So thank you for the voicemail. We got a text message to Oscar. The phone number is hot. It's hot. Are people trying to prove? I think they're trying to prove you wrong. Me wrong on this. <laughs> uh, this is from a listener, Pam. I will just say Pam N. I don't want to say last names. She says, "Hi, Jason and Oscar. I've been loving the rebroadcast of the shows. Looking forward to new shows. I'm currently listening to episode 22. That was our Mandela Effect episode. Great episode." And I'm wondering, will Joe and Dave ever come back to the show? Thank you, Pam. Good question, uh, Pam. Thank you for the message, Pam. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to call it Pamela Nitro. Her name is Pamela Nitro. I like that. Yeah. Just like WWE wrestler, Pamela yeah. Nitro. Pamela Nitro. I don't want her fucking hitting me with a chair, you know? What would her uh, signature move be, do you think? Oh, let's see. I mean, she throws sticks of dynamite, right? Has to. Nitro. Nitroglycerin. She, she's like, throwing those dynamites on the fucking stage. Yeah. Comes in that way. Could they well, do you, that? you just hear pop, pop, pops, you know, of explosions. Um, well, like little nitro sticks, not like big ones. Oh, and, gotcha. You know, throws them on the stage. That's how she makes her entrance. That's her finishing move. She stacks, she attaches them to the corners of the ring. So when she slams foes into them, they blow up on contact. It's, it's great. That's, that's, her, that's her thing. I would, I would see that show. Yeah, I would. That, would, that would be a good show. Right. Anyway, what did she, what happened? <laughs> so she wants to know if Dave and Joe are ever coming back to the show. Oh, and right, right, right. On the main feed, probably not. Um, but we've been considering possibly a Patreon episode, uh, bringing all four of us back and just kind of seeing what happens, see where oh, really? it goes. Oh, when we, because I know we, we floated this idea before. I thought that we would make it for the main feed. Um, well, not no, also. 
I guess that it's better that way you said it because we don't know how long it'll actually be. We don't know what, what content, right? And I also feel that it should be video. That, that's got to be video, bringing all four of us back together after, I don't know, almost two years now. Right. That, that should be video, I think. Yeah. But we'll, we'll chew on that. Uh, we'll pray on that a little bit. Uh, so thank you for the message, Pam. And that's all I got. <laughs> it's all right. I mean, uh, in general, I, I, I've been getting oral feedback from people telling me, like, mm. not that kind of oral. Sorry. Um, feedback on our show uh, lately um, from either – because I work at Starbucks. So it's a very public place, of course. So I tell, obviously, mainly employees, but I also tell some people who ask follow-up questions. They're like, you know, when they ask, you're like, oh, how's – if they say something, oh, what are you reading or what, you know, what's going – whatever. If it ever comes up naturally, I would say it then. It's not like I'm constantly saying I have a podcast it's called the SOS. But when it does come up, I do mention it. And sometimes some of those people that I mention it to do actually listen to the show and they come back to me and they're like, I'm like, oh my God, it's really cool how you did this thing. I'm like, oh no, that was actually all Jay or that was all Dave or that was whatever. I tried to, I tried to deflect. I'm like, oh no, I'm not that good. But thank you for listening to the show. Um, and some of them, are, they can't, you know what I love about, I don't know, maybe this is just me, Jay. Um, what I love about when people mention the show to me after they listen to it is yeah. that they can't wait to offer me a subject or an idea for an episode. Oh, they yes. often come to me with, oh my God, have you heard of this guy? You know, I, I, they'll be like, oh, I'm, I heard your Gacy episode. It reminds me of this serial killer from my home country. I'm like, really? And what was he like? What happened? I'm like, oh man, he was called the Hatchet Man. And she would just go into these detail, right? And, and that's a real, this is real. This, yeah. I'm actually describing a real one, yeah. Yeah, the real, Hatchet Man. I'm yeah. actually going to do, I'm going to do research on this guy. Uh, down the road, though, it'll probably be like a, I don't know, like a late spring or early spring release. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, and, and she told me about it. I'm like, that sounds cool. And because of that, I like found another interesting subject because of that one suggestion. And, um, and we've already benefited from these rewards. And uh, like the, the bonus episode I did on the deep sea stuff yeah. came from one, from one person suggesting it to me. Um, like it started there, like they showed me videos. I'm like, oh, this reminds me of this. I'm like, oh, yeah, I've had an idea like this before. And it kind of led me to like, you know, like solidify it in my brain a bit more and then do it. It's awesome. I would say it takes more than one thing to inspire me. But you know what I mean? Like, like oh, that's a cool idea. I'll look into it. And then I'll look into it. Yeah. I mean, we can only come up with so many ideas. So Right. Right. We welcome them. Definitely. So do not be afraid, guys. I do use suggestions. Yes, him do. Yes, not um, proper English. <laughs> the easiest way to contact the Supernatural Occurrence Studies podcast is by visiting our website, chicagoghostpodcast.com. From chicagoghostpodcast.com, you can get to all of our social platforms, including Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, Patreon. And speaking of Patreon, for just $5 a month, you could have access to Patreon-only podcast episodes. These are podcast episodes that will never appear in this public feed. It's just for our patrons. It's our way of saying thank you. Thank you for believing in us, and thank you for the support. But unfortunately, it does appear on the Netflix queues in other countries. Sure. You ever heard of that before? No. It's like a, a very popular American show won't be available here unless you pay for it. But then like in Australia, it'll be on their Netflix. No, I had no idea. Oh, I thought you knew this. Okay, no. my bad. Yeah, yeah, like big movies or big TV shows sometimes will happen. Even like new ones, like brand new ones, will come out, will be available on their streaming platforms, but not ours. Well, I mean, they also get stuff that, I mean, they also don't have stuff we have also, but like, it's just weird. Yeah, That is weird. But you had me for a second. I'm like, are we on fucking Netflix somewhere? No, no, no. Like, I was going to say, I was gonna say nine, XM, though. but I figured that reference might not work, so I went with Netflix. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Uh, so join our Patreon, show support for the show, uh, or you can just go right to this episode show notes and click on the Patreon link, and it'll take you right there. Oscar, we do have a phone number. I'm not sure if you're aware of that um, little fact. If you're – look, I, I told you on the last show that I'm trying to move past this. Oh, that's right. I shouldn't egg and you on. The fact that you're – right. Yeah, exactly. Egging me on. You're throwing eggs, deviled eggs, upon my exterior. I don't think that <laughs> – I don't think that'll will work for you very well, and uh, because I will take this 
fake ass phone number and t- and, and take it to the streets if I have to. Damn, I will take it just yeah. like that. You know that Gangster. scene in The Godfather? Uh, I don't. I'm not gonna get all the names right, okay? Because I don't remember all the names right now. When uh, James Con t- uh, takes out her little sister's um, husband on the streets yeah, and beats course. the fuck out of him. Yeah, he's the phone number. And I'm Jimmy Khan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I'll, I should I should create like a gif of that and just put the number and then I'll I think title. I was just thinking the same thing. I swear to God, I got you. Yeah. Should that's great. I don't know how people do those things, but I can do it. I don't know. That uh, that scene isn't that like the worst fake punch ever thrown in a in a movie or something like that. Also, fake uh, the one of the worst fake um garbage can. <laughs> yeah. Them. I, I you feel could tell where it actually hit. Hilarious, but it works. You know, it was back then. And it works. It does work. It does work. Uh, no, we we do have a phone number. It's a Chicago area code, eight seven two, five two nine zero seven six seven. Chicago, London. Eight seven two five two nine zero seven six seven. Leave us a message. Send us a text. We'll read them and play them on the show. Oscar, let's take a break. Did you know that phone number in hex <laughs> means fuck off? Sorry. And here's a break. Okay. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I have done terrible things. Listeners, welcome back to the show. Well, the lights are turned down low, the ceremonial candle is lit, and the drinks are flowing. Let's start this show. So, Oscar, what do you know about our topic this evening, holy relics? I know that this question sounds like a deja vu, but (laughs) besides that... Is this a retake? (laughs) Besides that, I know that Holy Relics, I don't know much about them. I know that Holy Relics, when I think of the, that name, that title for things, or those two words, um, I think of talismans. And um, and I always think that talismans and, like, Holy Relics are very, like, they're special, but I don't know if they're special because they're only connected to to a way of thinking or if it's something personal or if it's like holy relics, it's supposed to link to some sort of religion or some sort of belief or um, a doctrine of some sort, right? Um, I guess I don't know the main difference between them, but I always think of talismans every time I hear holy relics. Yeah, good. And and there's a lot of similarity, I would say, between holy relics and a talisman. A talisman could really be anything. It's anything that holds power and significance to you okay okay the, the like holy, a horcrux kind of like, yeah kind of like it to bring harry potter into it yeah or a porky no, i'm kidding sorry i don't know why i'm harry pottering this <laughs> i could never have too much potter uh hp uh whereas the the relics we're talking about there's actually classifications of the relics and, and what makes them special based on categories Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the relics I'm going to be talking about really focus kind of on the, the Catholic and Orthodox belief. Okay, these are very specific. 
They're associated with saints, um, and they're categorized. Where again, a talisman could be anything. You know, um, a marble could be a talisman to somebody, right? Or a, a fetish statue could be a talisman to a tribe. These holy relics we're talking about are very specific to the Catholic and Orthodox religion. Does that make does that kind of help a little bit? It does help. It also helps in a way like how because a lot of people imbue or not imbue, so that's not the right word. Uh, they believe that talismans slash holy relics are imbued with power, right. curses, you know, something actually that affects you. But if, let's say, I'm a grave robber and I find a talisman or a holy relic in some um, burial site, um, and I don't believe in the orthodox way of this or the Judean Christianity version of this, um, would it affect that person? I think that's where you get into some kind of like mud, right? You don't know if it'll work on you or not. You know what I'm saying? Because if you believe in the holy relic, then ideally you can believe in its magic. Right. right? I I'm not saying this is all right. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm just saying this is how it feels. Um, kinda, it it kind of feels like it's like one of those things where like Indiana Jones can steal you because he doesn't believe in God. But like his, you know, his partner that does believe in God would get cursed by whatever he's stealing because he does believe in Christianity or whatever. So when he steals that cross or whatever it is, it's going to be repercussion city, you know? Yeah, right. Um, but I know a lot of people believe about that. I think a lot of people immediately say or think that talismans are connected to magic in some way. Agreed. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Maybe even more so than holy relics, I would say. Maybe because we holy relics exist and we can look at them today in museums and touch them, whereas, like you said, talismans uh, seem to be much more about tr tribal, more personal, more specific. And because it is, a lot of people don't know of its importance. Therefore, they're not going to be in museums and shit. You know. True. Yeah. Yeah. And and some certainly would. Uh, but yeah. You know, a, a holy relic is not um a fetish statue like I, I mentioned. It's not right. a personal artifact left by your deceased grandmother. You know, that's 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 not a relic. That that could be more of a talisman. Right. Um, but I think the whole holy relics offer. Catholics and, and Orthodox in, in this episode's case, a way to personally connect with the communion of saints, kind of like how we cherish little mementos of deceased family members, kind of in the same vein. Mm -hmm. But these relics are directly associated with saintly people. Okay. They're not icons. They're not paintings, iconography. They're very specific artifacts. And in researching this episode, this stuff is fascinating. I've always been fascinated with religion. You know, I was a religion minor in college. Uh, I wanted to have some sort of religious, uh, get into some sort of religious work as when I grew up, right? Uh, never worked out. I was too rough around the edges, but uh, I, 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 I'm fascinated by it. And he and, still is, folks. Guess I What's that? Getting Rubber older? on the edges. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so then I, I took up a minor in religion in college. I, I, I wanted to be a religion reporter. Um, really got into the Dan Brown uh, books, especially Da Vinci Code. Back then, me too. I remember we both read and talked about them. Yes. Really kind of fueled my, my fire for religious iconography and paintings and looking into it and researching it and kind of deciphering what was going on in those those ancient paintings but this stuff is fascinating and i thought it would fit with the the theme of our show because some of it it's gory as, as hell man like there's some nasty shit out there uh as far as backstories to these very important relics so i thought it would fit i wanted to give it a try and this is actually going to be a two-parter yes which i made fun of earlier i think I think I mentioned that earlier. Yeah. But Did I, you? Well, oh. I spoiled that surprise for you. Oh, yeah. we just have a two-parter. We're about to enter another one, and then I have my own two-parter coming up after. 
That's right. Well, I think in the title it says part one anyway. Oh, it does. Oh, well, there you go then. <laughs> um, never mind. Fuck what I said. Um, but it, you know what? My favorite thing about what you just said, though, about you know your a little bit of your backstory is that you're using your theology minor or degree, whatever you got from it, your studies, as um, you're putting it to good use today. Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. This was. This I was enthralled in this research. Awesome. Now, as I said, these these holy relics, they're directly associated with saints. And pretty much every saint has a number of relics associated with them that are considered holy. And those relics are categorized. There's three categories to holy relics. And again, I thought this was just really, really interesting. There, there, there's what are called first-class relics. Okay, first-class relics. Hmm which are remnants of the saints themselves, like bone uh, fragments, okay. flesh, body parts, or even blood. Hmm. Kind of gruesome. Yeah. Then there are second-class relics, which are items or pieces of items personally owned by the saint, like a book or an article of clothing. Then there are third-class relics, Items that the saint either touched or interacted with in some way. Okay. Like a person? Not a person. Um, if that guy, t if a saint touches my eyelid and I cut the eyelid out, does, does that. Well, then I guess technically that would be a third class relic because they that's, interacted with it. That's what I'm saying. Isn't it crazy? I'm sure someone out there in the past has done that. By definition, that would work. Right. Ugh. I know. I'm, I know. I'm being funny and technical about it, but it, it, it's maybe a little true, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, something else I found interesting: the selling of a relic, the selling of a relic is is considered a sin. Can't do it. Cannot do it. Huh. As is the displaying of a relic in a vulgar or obscene way. Huh. And I, I can't think what that might look like. But it's true nonetheless. Okay. Eye of the beholder type situation. Yeah, right. I, right. I couldn't find an example of a vulgar display of a, a relic. I looked, uh, so I can't picture what that is. But it's... you know, when you when you said that vulgar, when you said that word specifically, you know what it reminded me of? The Wait, statue in in the, in the church of the Exorcist. Exorcist three. No, I was thinking of the first one with a defamation of the statue in the church. In the first one, with the pointed nipples and the blood. That wasn't that. Wasn't that. that was part three. No, that was part one. I mean, look it up. I'm, pretty, I'm, I'm right. Well, then they brought it back in three, I think. They probably did. Maybe Shit. they did. Oh, I should know that. You should. You're a big, you're a big uh, fan huge, of those movies. A huge Exorcist yeah. fan. But, but it reminded me of you're absolutely right. When I found that nugget, I, that's where I went to. That's good. Now, something that's really important to remember as we go through this episode and, and the next is that all relics must be certified. And the Vatican has an incredibly detailed method of certification that must be followed with all relics before they could be designated authentic and put on display for veneration. Okay. As we go through this episode, I'm going to talk about what I think are some pretty incredible relics that have been deemed holy and worthy of veneration that are actually out there in the world. Items that, if you're a practicing Catholic especially, they, they stop and make you say, holy shit. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> I can't believe these things are really out there. They're actually out there. Just knowing that these items had to go through a Vatican approved authentication process and that they have been deemed as close to authentic as you could get is just mind boggling. So there are rules here. Like I said, there are canonical procedures that must be followed during the process of verifying the authenticity of a relic and the mortal remains of a saint or of the blessed. The instructions spell out specific steps pertaining to a person's canonical recognition or obtaining the church's approval saying that, yes, this person is a saint or of the blessed, 
and we're going to talk about what makes a saint here in a little bit. Oh, good, good. Yeah. There are canonical rules concerning the extraction of fragments and creation of relics from a saint or blessed. There are rules overseeing the transfer of the urn or the container containing relics, rules for transfers, transfer of ownership of relics, and rules that must be followed to gather the personnel necessary to make the pilgrimage to collect relics, say, to a holy site overseas. Collectively, these strict rules and procedures are designed to better guarantee a relic's authenticity and preservation while approving and tracking its movements, in other words, its, prominent, its prominence, and to confidently promote the relic's veneration. And no relic can be displayed for veneration without a proper certificate of the ecclesiastical authority who guarantees its authenticity. This is a real long-winded way to say, when I talk about some really amazing relics here in, in this episode and the next, you got to keep in mind these things have been authenticated uh, to the nth degree. By all accounts, they're real. And that, that's important, okay? Mm -hmm. And that brings us to our next point here. Scripture teaches that God acts through relics specifically when it comes to healing. And this is really important to remember. It's not the relics themselves that have a magical quality. Think about your talisman question, right? Right. The relics themselves don't have the magical quality like a talisman would because they're associated with a saint. It's God choosing to act through the relics that give them their power. Very different. Does that make sense? Yes. Now, like I said, according to scripture... Healing is kind of the most most of the relics thing. It's what they do. For example, in the New King James Bible, in 2 Kings chapter 13, verse 21, it says, quote, So it was, as they were burying a man, that suddenly they spied a band of raiders, and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. End quote. Now, Elisha was the attendant and disciple of the prophet Elijah, and he was Elijah's successor, thus becoming a prophet himself. So in this Bible verse, we have a dead guy being placed in a tomb in a hurry because en enemies were on the horizon, these raiders. And in that rushed burial, the man's body accidentally touched Elisha's remains, and in turn, the man is brought back to life. Elisha's remains are a first-class relic. And through touching the relic, the man is brought back from the dead. And here's another example, also from the New King James Bible, where third-class holy relics have miraculous healing powers. Now, this quote is from the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 11 through 12. And this is a quote, of course. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out of them, end quote. This verse is interpreted as just random people, believers, bringing handkerchiefs and Paul, articles of you know, clothing or cloth, to, to Paul and St. Paul the Apostle, by the way, that's who we're talking about, and they're laying their, their handkerchiefs and apron upon Paul, after which the now third-class relics were placed upon people who were sick or possessed by demons, and those people were instantly cured simply by coming into contact with these third-class relics from Paul. Right. And finally, from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verse 20 through 22, quote, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well, end quote. And the woman was made well from within that hour. Wow. That's the end quote. Sorry. And the woman and was made well. Right, right. Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so that was the end of my quote. I messed up. But here we have a second-class relic, Jesus' clothes, believed to be his cloak, actually, in this reading, instantly healing a woman suffering some, some sort of, from some sort of terrible prolonged hemorrhage. Just some biblical examples of these first, second, third class relics, right? Is there a potency to the class of relics? 
Because based on these two, a few stories, it doesn't seem like there is. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I didn't pick up on a potency based on class through doing all this research. Because it reminds me of, um, uh, uh, sorry, a little bit off the rails. It reminds me of a movie called In Bruges. Up there, the top altar, is a file brought back by a Flemish knight from the Crusades in the Holy Land. And that file, do you know what it's said to contain? No, what's it said to contain? It's said to contain some drops of Jesus Christ's blood. Have you seen I it? remember that. I think I did. Okay, it's a silly movie about hitmen. It's a funny movie. And they're in Bruges, which is in Belgium. And in it, they visit this... Uh, not a, it's a, what do you call it? A, a church, yes, but it's uh, something else, like a big fucking old church. They visit this as part of the tourism they have there. Like they have a lot of old architecture, right? And, um, and in it, supposedly, there's a whole long line for it. Supposedly, there's like something, like a part of the thing inside the church where they, they have this, either the remnants of a weapon or, the, or something that apparently a drop or so of Jesus Christ's blood was on it you just sit down and just wait your pretty little head oh okay am i going too far it just reminds me of that Bruges, it... no it's great Bruges comes into this oh you're kidding that no. is... oh, okay i'm, I'm sorry no. i do no, it all the time to you i'm so sorry I do that's all nuts the time. no i can't believe I, I didn't know i didn't make the connection with the movie but yes there is something very important in in Bruges. okay Cool. And it's it's exactly what you're talking about. Okay, I'll shut up now. No, don't. I I think it's great. Perfect lead into something I like that. I often do this though. I always say like, oh yeah, but what about this? And you like Oscar? That's gonna come up. I'm like, all yeah, right. No, it's all good. All right, cool. I, it's I didn't make the connection in the movie. Great, great connection. Um, that, that that's an important one. And just like the way he says it, because Colin Farrell has no interest to go up there. He's this guy's trying to sell it to him. Like that's Jesus Christ's blood. And he's like, do you want to go up there? And he's like, do I have to? I'm like, do you have to? It's only Jesus Christ's blood. <laughs> do you have to? Of course you don't have to. It's Jesus' fucking blood, isn't it? Of course you don't fucking have to. Of course you don't fucking have to. <laughs> and he's yelling at him, and it's really funny. So, Well, yeah. um, I love Colin Farrell, too. Uh, I'll yeah. have to check that. I know I've seen it. I have, it's been a long time. It's great. I quote that movie a little too much in my life. <laughs> um, okay. Now, what's really fun is that holy relics are not just tall tales spun up by the Bible's authors to create these powerful stories. Holy relics are very real. Their power is based on your beliefs, of course, but believe it or not, there are likely quite a few holy relics in your own backyard, like in your own neighborhood right now. You see, when the Second Council of Nicaea met in the year 787, one of its main goals was to reconcile what was known as the iconoclastic controversy. You see, in the Byzantine Empire, in the 8th and 9th centuries, there arose a group of people called the iconoclasts, who were vehemently against religious imagery and the veneration or worship of religious icons. The iconoclasts felt that worshiping religious icons was an affront to the Old Testament Ten Commandments, specifically if following the New King James Version of the Bible, the Second Commandment which reads, quote, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments, end quote. So, so here God is saying in no uncertain terms that the creation of anything of heavenly nature, uh, i.e. paintings or images of Christ, or of an earthly nature, um, paintings or, or images of human saints, is strictly prohibited. And woe to you and four generations of your children if you create and worship those items. So, in the year 726, Byzantine Empire Leo III basically outlawed the creation and veneration of religious paintings and religious icons. But the Second Council of Nicaea of 787 decided, in so many words, that in each scriptural instance of someone being healed by the touching of an icon or a relic, those instances were God himself 
bringing about a healing using a material object, that the vehicle for the healing was the touching of that object. It's very important to note that the cause of the healing is God, and the icons and relics are a means through which he acts. In other words, relics aren't magic. They don't contain a power of their own, a power separate from God. Any good that comes about through a relic is God's doing. And the fact that God chooses to use the relics of saints to work healing and miracles tells us that he wants to draw our attention to the saints as role models and intercessors, uh, people who intervene on our behalf, in other words, especially through prayer and prayer and veneration. So not only did the Second Council of Nicaea give a thumbs up to the veneration of religious iconography, they also made a decree that said relics are to be placed in all churches and that no church can be properly consecrated without relics. So if the purpose of relics is to draw our attention to the saints as role models, what exactly makes a saint? In, in broad terms, a saint is classified as a person in heaven who lived a heroically virtuous life, offered their life for others, or were martyred for their faith, and therefore are worthy of imitation. According to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, a department within the central government of the Catholic Church, which dates back to 1588 and is responsible for making recommendations to the Pope on canonizations and the authentication and preservation of relics, there are three steps to sainthood. Okay, this is interesting. First, a candidate becomes venerable. Next, they become blessed. And finally, they are canonized a saint, a person that is worthy of universal veneration. Now, let's take a closer look at these three steps. First and foremost, before the process of declaring someone a saint could even begin, five years must pass from the time of a candidate's death. This is to allow emotions caused by the person's passing to cool down and dissipate so that the person being considered for sainthood can be examined objectively. Once the five years has passed, the bishop of the diocese in which the person died is responsible for beginning the investigation for sainthood. If the bishop gets the okay from the Holy See, the Vatican, to proceed with the investigation, a tribunal is formed whose job it is to, is to investigate the martyrdom or how the candidate lived a life of historic virtue, that is, the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. Once the investigation of how the candidate lived and died in the case of martyrdom, uh, it, once that's complete, all eyewitness testimony and documentation is sent to the Congregation for the Causes of Saints in Rome. From there, all evidence is organized into a postito, or a detailed summary of all documented evidence collected by the bishop who initiated the investigation. The purpose of the postito is to prove the, the, his, the heroic exercise of virtue or the martyrdom of the person being considered for sainthood. The Posito is then examined by nine theologians who vote on whether or not the person died a martyr or whether or not the person lived a heroic life. If the theologians vote yes, the case for sainthood is then passed to a panel of cardinals and bishops who again must vote. And if this vote is favorable, the case is brought to the Pope, who gives his approval and declares the person either venerable if they lived a virtuous life or blessed if they were martyred. Now, keep in mind, this is all just the first stage. All this happens, and the person isn't even a saint yet. Next, for stage two, a miracle associated with the person after their death must be documented. The steps of documenting a miracle basically mirror the steps in declaring a person venerable or blessed, ending with the Pope granting the person what's called beautification, or limited public veneration usually limited to the diocese, the diocese, region, or religious community in which the person lived. Hmm. Now, upon the Pope's beautification, the person is granted the title of blessed. 
And if the person died a martyr, no miracle is needed to receive the title of blessed from the Pope. And finally, in order for a person to receive canonization or sainthood and to be venerated publicly and recognized by the universal church, one more miracle must be attributed to the person and thoroughly documented and approved in the same way the person became venerable and then blessed. I thought these steps were really interesting and in depth, especially the documenting and voting on miracle, miracles part. Here we are in 2021, we're, we're, we're ruled by science and technology and skepticism, yet miracles are investigated and recognized and in, attributed to people that are dead. And again, it reminds me about the uh, those rules you never think of when you think of um, in The Exorcist when it comes to proving someone is possessed. Yeah, yeah. Proving right. their possession, improving a case for the Vatican to approve someone to be then exorcised. It was a whole ordeal in part of that film. Um, it kind of reminds you of like all the the red tape, the applications, or the applications, uh, the the requirements. Yeah. Right. To 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 do just exorcism. This is for something much bigger and everlasting, and I mean like everlasting for as long as there's Catholicism or or, or Christianity, whatever. Mm-hmm. There will always be Saint X Y Z, and um, it's so it's funny how the hardest thing to not the hardest thing, but yet the most extensive probing, you know, think about a person is after their death. And I think it's kind of funny how that's like a process that it doesn't hurt the individual they're talking about because they're dead already. Yeah. Must be the one of the few times in all of the world where a process like that does not involve the person in question. That's a good point. Right. Now, not about, only they're dead, they're yeah. at least five years dead. F- at least five. You know, when you said the five year thing, this surprised me. I thought it was like longer. I thought it was like a generation length like i thought they they did it like the way um the way the american government do with declassifying information they declassify information when all the parties involved are dead yeah or retired you know that's when they bust that out so to speak um but no it's much shorter than that i thought that and there's a good reason why they wait five years but for some reason i thought it would be longer because of the staying power of that one person. There's too many people alive that would, you know, kind of like tip the scales, right? So to speak. Yeah. But I guess maybe that's not the point. So it makes sense too. Yeah. yeah. Interesting stuff though, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting. In today's day and age. Now, here's an example. Our, co- our current Pope canonized Maria Rita Lopez Pontes, also known as Sister Dolce, or now Saint Dolce of the Poor. On October 13th, 2019, the first Brazilian saint of our time. Don't do it, guys. The casualties would be in the Brazilians. Hmm. Now, the first verified miracle associated with Sister Sister Dolce happened after a woman named Claudia Cristina dos Santos suffered grave hemorrhaging after giving birth. Faced with a deadly situation, a priest was called in to minister the anointing of the sick, kind of like the last rites, right? Right. During the anointing, a prayer was recited requesting the intercession of Sister Dolce, and Claudia was given a small Sister Dolce relic, and Claudia's hemorrhaging stopped, like immediately. Sixteen medical experts examined Claudia's case, and none could explain the sudden stop of bleeding. It was a miracle. Now, yeah. Yeah. Now, the second verified miracle associated with Sister Dolce was the healing of a blind man. And I'm saying Sister Dolce because while these miracles are happening, she's not a saint yet. Now, the blind man named Maurizio was suffering a particularly bad case of conjunctivitis, which caused extreme pain in his eyes. Maurizio held an image of Sister Dolce to his eyes and prayed fervently for her, her intercession to ease his pain. The next morning when Maurizio woke up, Not only was his pain gone, he was no longer blind. And just like with the hemorrhaging uh, hemorrhaging mother, Claudia, Maurizio's case too was thoroughly investigated and ultimately deemed a miracle. So there's two miracles associated with St. Dolce of the Poor, canonized a saint in 2019, and a whole lot of information uh, about becoming a saint. Now, let's get back to Holy Relics. 
Now, we were talking about the Second Council of Nicaea and the importance of icons and, the, and relics as reminders of saints to live like they did and to venerate them as intercessors on our behalf. And we mentioned that saintly relics are so important that no church can be consecrated without them. All this is my extremely long-winded winded way of saying that right now, Catholic and Orthodox churches in your neighborhood have relics of some class that you could visit or at least be in the presence of, you know, in case the relics are hidden. And actually, most relics are embedded in churches' altars away from public view. Oh, okay. Uh, like you can see them from where you're sitting, but you can't like approach it or, or touch it. Usually the answer to that is no, you can't see them. Now some churches- Oh, not even, not even see them. Okay, my bad. Correct, correct. Uh, some churches do display this stuff, but overall, no. Is it is it considered to be bad form or is that to discourage any kind of thievery? I really think it's to discourage bad thievery. things happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now I'm sure you could uh, possibly, if it's not embedded in the altar, they have it somewhere in the church. I'm sure you could ask somebody- to right. see it and they may let you mm -hmm. that's why i said you can see them or at least be in the presence of them you know in your own right. neighborhood, catholic and orthodox church I, I have an aunt who is uh really into this stuff um well i should say she's really into her church and therefore i mean she's visited the holy site and stuff like that many times she's gone to middle east and stuff wow and um and it's, uh, I'm sure she would find all this very, I'm sure, I don't know how much she knows. I'd be curious to ask her, but she often talks about this kind of thing. And obviously it goes through my head most times. Yeah. But it'd be nice if I approach her next time and say like, huh, did you know Dolce yeah. did this? I'm like, yeah, how did you know that? <laughs> oh, she'll be, like, you know, or she'll be like, no, I don't know that. I don't want to mess with her now. But it reminds me of that because I've been to that church many times, uh, St. John Bosco specifically. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, um, I've been to that church many, 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 many times. And um, I've seen the altar many times. And of course, I've never been backstage or anything like that. Like like the Rolling Stones concert, right? I don't have the state, I don't have the passes for that. No all access but, pass. But my aunt and my family, my like my mom, and they do, because they're speakers, they're often speakers. So like they get, I'm sure they have seen it. And I'm curious to ask them questions now. Yeah, so. or at least if they haven't seen it, have them ask someone at that church. Correct. I will. I think because I, I guarantee you there's one at least. Right, right. I want to know what it is. That's what was so cool about this. So, like, for example, right here in the Chicagoland area, we have a number of holy relics. Our Illinois listeners can visit right now. At Queen of All Saints Basilica in Chicago, you can see over 150 first and second class relics, including bone fragments from the 12 apostles, a piece of the Last Supper table. A piece of the rock from the Garden of Gethsemane, the Whoa. place where, where Jesus Christ sweat blood while con contemplating his upcoming crucifixion. Right. He was just thinking about it. That's, they made a whole thing about just him thinking about it. Right? Yeah, that's, a, that's where it happened. Supposedly there's a rock from that location wow. at this church. And there's even supposedly a piece of Jesus' clothing there. <laughs> Now, while researching this episode, I discovered that St. Luke Church in River Forest, Illinois, where the church where my wife and I got married and where my daughter was baptized, mm -hmm. contains a relic of St. Maria Goretti, the patron saint of youth, young women, purity and victims of rape wow isn't that interesting did you go to our church yeah right you yeah were there both the times wedding. both times i think yeah. i was there for the, both for the baptism, baptism too. too yeah mm -hmm. so you were in the presence of i remember the car oh the old gangster car we had the old gangster car you have rented right exactly yeah. i remember so you were you were in the presence of a holy relic i didn't know that i wish i brought my good my good tie then <laughs> <laughs> so i thought that was really cool I had no idea at the time didn't i didn't bring my a game that day hmm <laughs> I contacted a deacon over there who's very close to my family. And, nice. Uh, so, nice. you know, I'm doing research for this show, and he's like, actually, I thought that was cool. Yeah, speaking of which. Now, at Chicago's famous Holy Name Cathedral over on State Street, there's a first-class relic of uh, St. John the Apostle, patron saint of love, loyalty, friendships, and authors. And there's a relic of St. Timothy, the patron saint invoked against stomach and intestinal, intestinal disorders. 
And then there's the incredible, incredible shrine of all saints housed at the St. Martha of Bethany Church in Morton Grove, uh, Illinois, of course, inside the gym of St. Martha's closed Catholic school. Now, the Shrine of All Saints is the second largest collection of holy relics in the United States, the first largest collect collection being St. Anthony's Shrine in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now, the Shrine of All Saints features over 2,000 relics from over 3,000 saints, everything from bones, teeth, hair, blood, clothing, you name it. And, and most are housed in these beautiful, what are called reliquaries, or these ornate containers made for holy relics, which are really pieces of artwork themselves, these reliquaries. Now, some of the relics on display at the Shrine of All Saints are bone fragments and a fibula, a, a lower leg bone, from St. Peter, one of Christ's 12 apostles, and one who, according to tradition, was crucified upside down. Because, because he thought he was unworthy to die like Jesus did. You can see a few strands of Mother Teresa's hair and fragments from the cave of the Nativity of Christ in Bethlehem, the believed birthplace of Jesus Christ, which were recently donated to the Shrine of All Saints after being housed in the lobby of, the Chicago's, of Chicago's famed Tribune Tower for approximately 72 years. Whoa. The fragments from the cave of the, of the nativity were given to past Chicago Tribune publisher, Colonel Robert McCormick, back in 1949. And the collection process and the fragments themselves were verified authentic by then Bethlehem mayor, Isa Basil Bandick. And now I've been inside the Tribune Tower many times, and I never knew it had pieces from the nativity in there. My unobservant ass. Now, also at the Shrine of All Saints, you can see some fragments of the Titleist, the board mounted to the cross on which Jesus was crucified, the one that read Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's there at this Shrine of All Saints. That's amazing to me. There are fragments from the house in which the Last Supper was held. And the Shrine of All Saints even has relics, bone fragments, that are believed to be from St. Nicholas. Yes. At St. Nicholas, the inspiration for Santa Claus. Right. So the long and short, holy relics from some of the biggest names and events in the Catholic faith are just on display right now in the small suburbs of Morton Grove, Illinois. And I, Oscar, I never even knew this place existed. And I'm telling you, as soon as COVID restrictions ease up, I'm checking this out. Um, and listeners, if this topic interests you, just Google holy relics in holy relics in along with your town or city or even your state. And I guarantee just like me, you'll find some that you never even knew existed. Now, of course, holy relics aren't just found here in the United States and suburb of Illinois. Uh, they're found all over the world and some in very prominent displays. For example, a thorn believed to be from the actual crown of thorns placed on Jesus's head during crucifixion can be found in a beautiful beyond words reliquary made of gold and precious jewels in the British Museum in London. While the actual crown of thorns, the crown of thorns that were rested on Jesus' head, mm -hmm. or what's believed to be the actual crown of thorns, right? The holy crown of thorns, as it's known, is now housed at the Louvre in Paris after being rescued from the Notre Dame Cathedral Inferno in April 2019 where it was housed since the French Revolution, or since approximately 1789, it was kept Whoa. at Notre Dame. Wow. Now, if you travel to Prum Abbey in the Diocese of Trier, Germany, you can see a gold reliquary containing Jesus Christ's sandals, his holy slippers, his holy high steppers, Oscar. <laughs> Christ's sandals were considered the most important relic in the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. And, you know, we should have said this in the beginning. I'm going to say it now. Go to the show notes. I have pictures of all these things so you can see what they look like. Again, just, incre just incredible. Now, this next one's crazy. What about John the Baptist's head? Head? Head. Like his physical yes. decapitated head? Yes. Okay. Now, according to all four canonical gospels of the New Testament, 
that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as the account of the ancient Jewish, Jewish historian Josephus, John the Baptist was killed on the orders of a local ruler sometime before Jesus' crucifixion. The Gospels claim that John the Baptist was beheaded and his head put on a platter and delivered to King Herod's son, Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee during the first century. Now, today, the head of John the Baptist is one of the most sought after Christian relics. I mean, this is the guy that baptized Jesus Christ. Now, depending on who you ask and what religion you follow, no fewer than four different institu institutions claim to hold the, hold the relic of John the Baptist's head. Four. Four. Yes. So three of them, at least three of them are <laughs> at wrong. Least are wrong. Maybe yeah. all of them are wrong. <laughs> now, in Damascus, Syria, the Umayyad Mosque, which was built in the 8th century on the site of a Christian church named for John the Baptist, hmm. his head is said to be buried in a shrine there. In Munich, Germany, the Residence Museum includes John the Baptist's skull, among a number of relics collected by Duke Wilhelm, Wilhelm V of Bavaria with the Pope's permission in the mid-16th century. A fragment of skull identified as belonging to the head of John the Baptist is on display at the Church of San Silvestro in Capite, Rome. Hmm. In the 13th century Cathedral of Amiens in, in Amiens, France, I think I'm saying that right, was built specifically to house the head of John the Baptist which a crusader supposedly brought back from Constantinople in 1206. And apparently St. John's head was housed there for some time, but was evidently lost at some point in history. And now a replica of the head rests there instead. Maybe. Articles differ on that point. But the head in Amiens, France, seems to be the most photographed head. Maybe because it actually is a replica, and therefore people are allowed to photograph it. I I'm not sure. Hmm. I couldn't find a hard rule when it comes to photographing relics. I, I checked. Too updated? Like it's something that's so... Um, <sighs> yeah, I just... You know what I'm saying? It's such an ancient... Not ancient, I guess, but it's an older set of rules where photography as a technology wasn't maybe around, right? When they were... <laughs> Yeah, of course, but or maybe it's just faux pas. I don't, I don't know. There, there seems to be no hard rule about photographing these things. I mean, I, mean, mm. I have some in the show notes. Well, it doesn't affect the subject. Maybe that's why they don't care to put a stamp to it, right? Yeah, I think of like art, art, art uh, museums where you know the, oh, the, the flash, constant flashing from patrons, uh, you know, could d degrade the painting or something. That's kind of what I was thinking. But again, no mm. hard rule. I, I tried to find that. Is that a thing? What? The painting, the flashes of... Yeah, things. yeah, huh. definitely. I know that. Now, what I do know is that photo of the uh, photos of the other heads or fragments of the skull are incredibly difficult to find, like next to none. No photos of John the Baptist's head, except for that possibly fake one. And again, I've left pictures of these amazing relics and some of the other relics we're going to talk about in the show notes so you guys can see this for yourself. Now... I couldn't find any miracles associated with John the Baptist's head, but I did find a supernatural story about the head after it was hacked from John the Baptist's body. For this story, I had to go deep and dust off the archives to a book called The Life of John the Baptist, which is a book from the New Testament Apocrypha, allegedly written by a Greek, uh, a Greek named S uh, Serpion, Bishop of Thumis. Serpion, the Bishop of Thumis, in 390 AD. Now, according to Serpion, when John the Baptist's head was brought to Herod on the platter, this is a quote from this uh, apocryphal writing, quote, it rose from the dish and it flew to the middle of the, conv the convival room, whatever the hell that is, before the king and his high officials. In that very moment, the roof of the house was opened and the head of John flew into the air and it flew over Jerusalem and cried for three years to the town, saying, It is not lawful for you, O Herod, to marry the wife of your brother while he is still alive. End quote. Because at the time of John's beheading, that's exactly what Herod was trying to do. A huge no-no in those days. <laughs> and today, too, let's be honest. Right. Don't do that shit. Anyway, the quote continues. After the head had cried for three years, it went to all the world shouting and proclaiming the horrible crime of Herod and repeating the words, it is not lawful for you, O Herod, to marry the wife of your brother while he is still alive. 
15 years after it had been cut off, it ceased proclaiming and rested on the town of Horns. The faithful who were in that town took it and buried it with great pomp. A long time after, a church was built on it, which is still standing in our time. This church that the quote here is referring to, I believe, is now the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, Syria, the one we mentioned earlier, uh, the one that was built on top of a site uh, on the site of an ancient Christian church named after John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. So not only is John the Baptist's head located in multiple places, apparently it once had the power to fly and con- and to condemn wicked deeds. Right. Thought that was kind of interesting. Now, another holy relic that could be found in multiple locations, kind of like John the Baptist's head, but on a much larger scale, are pieces of the true cross, the pine wood cross, or the dogwood cross, or the olive wood cross, depending on what story you read, on which Christ was crucified. Now, according to legend, it was Helena Augustus, the mother of Emperor Constantine, who found the true cross in Jerusalem around 325 A.D., During a goodwill pilgrimage to Jerusalem on behalf of her son, Constantine, Helena found three crosses. Remember, Christ wasn't crucified alone. He was accompanied by the good thief and the unrepentant thief, right? Right, right. I remember. So she found three crosses. She found crucifixion nails and the Titleist that we mentioned earlier. Actually, Helena Augustus was sainted for her discovery, and she later became Saint Helena, just so you know. Now, it's said that the way Helena determined which of the three crosses was the true cross, a dead girl was brought in and her body was made to touch each cross. And when it touched the true cross, the dead girl came alive. Will you help me, Father? Of course, child. Will you pray for me? Kind of grim. So not only was Helena responsible for discovering the true cross, and the nails and the titleist, she was also responsible for distributing the true cross as she sent pieces of the cross to church leaders in Jerusalem, Rome, and Constantinople. Evidently, so much wood from the true cross was sent to church leaders by Helena, or the church leaders themselves broke apart their pieces of the wood and sent them to even more people as holy relics, that later in the fourth century, St. Cyril of Jerusalem said that the whole world had been filled with pieces of wood from the true cross. And even later, in the 16th century, Protestant theologian John Calvin famously joked that if all pieces linked to the true cross were assembled in one place, that they would make a big shipload of crosses. In other words, John Calvin and St. Cyril were severely questioning the authenticity of people claiming to own pieces of the true cross. There were just too many people and not enough cross. However, the Catholic Encyclopedia quotes the 19th century French archaeologist Charles Renault de Fleury. I, these names, Oscar, these names. I try. We all try, man. I mean, you, oh, you haven't released it yet. But yeah, we all fuck up. Yeah. Charles Renault de Fleury as saying that all of the cataloged true cross relics would amount to less than a third of the wood in a 10 to 13 foot high cross. And historically, it is believed that the true cross was 12 to 13 feet high. So who knows how many actual pieces of the true cross there really are out there. I know that right now you could go to eBay and buy a supposed true relic from the cross. So there's that. Now, obviously, there are going to be a number of churches that claim to have pieces of the true cross. Probably the most famous location that holds a piece of the true cross is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, an Mm. amazing church located where Christ was both crucified and where he rose from the dead. Just a monumental location in the Christian faith, as both Golgotha, the skull-shaped hill on which Christ was crucified, and the Holy Sepulchre, Christ's tomb, are part of this church's complex. And it is here inside a beautifully ornate gold reliquary that a piece of the true cross is displayed. And again, go to the show notes so you can see a picture of this true cross reliquary. Now, I'm sure you can imagine there are literally countless holy relics, both major and minor, that we could cover in this episode. And actually, there are four major relics I'd like to talk about, but I'm going to save those relics for the next episode. 
So again, this is a two-parter. Nice. But before we conclude this episode, I'd love to, I'd like to talk about one more amazing holy relic located at the Basilica of the Holy Blood in Bruges, Belgium. And this relic is the preserved blood of Jesus Christ. Nice. Sanguine Christi. Mm-hmm. Built between the years 1134 and 1149 as the Count of Flanders personal family church, the Basilica of the Holy Blood is actually two different churches built one on top of the other. The bottom chapel, which is dedicated to St. Basil the Great, a renowned theologian known for his care of the poor and underprivileged, is rather dark. It's a Romanesque stone structure that is pretty much unchanged since the time it was built in the mid-12th century. And this lower church does contain relics from St. Basil, although for the life of me, I could not find information on exactly what those relics are, even on the church's website. Yeah, just Hmm. couldn't find information on what they what they are a finger a bone a tooth i don't know the relic that's housed above saint basil's chapel seems to take all the limelight and seems to overshadow at least on the internet the relics hidden below now the upper church the one dedicated to sanguine christi or the blood of jesus christ was also originally built in a bland romanesque style just like saint basil's church below but it has since been updated and by updating i mean brought up to gothic standards at the end of the 15th century and construction in the late 1800s improved the church to its current architectural classification which is gothic revival so that's the update i'm talking about updated to gothic this church really is amazing though and it's just beautiful but i'm sure the church's architectural style isn't the main reason people flock to this ancient house of worship the main reason people flock to the basilica of the holy blood is to catch a glimpse of the reliquary housing Jesus Christ's blood. This amazing relic is actually a piece of cloth with Jesus' dried blood on it. Ah. The holy blood is housed in a rock crystal vial, which is held inside a small glass cylinder capped with a golden crown at each end. Now, the glass cylinder itself, which contains the rock crystal vial, inside which contained Jesus' blood, is kept in ornate, an ornate silver tabernacle, along with the sculpture of the Lamb of God, in a large side chapel off the upper church. Again, check the show notes to see photos of this relic. Now, even though the Bible never mentioned Jesus' blood being preserved after his crucifixion, the apocryphal Gospels do. And they assert that Joseph of Arimathea preserved the precious blood after he had washed Christ's dead body. Now, I want to briefly explain. The word apocryphal is Greek, meaning hidden or obscure. And the apocryphal gospels are early Christian or Gnostic texts, accounts, written in the same vein as the New New Testament biblical gospels, but were left out of the Bible for one reason or another. Basically, they weren't accepted by by the early church like the canonical gospels were. Again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, the term apocryphal gospel applies to any non-canonical early work that claims to have recorded the life and teachings of Jesus. It's important to note that neither the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, or the Protestants accept any of the apocryphal gospels as authoritative or divinely inspired. They're just not having it. However, and I think this is a big however, modern scholarship, modern religious study, generally accepts the apocryphal gospels as accurate records, which are needed to give us a full picture of the life and teachings of Jesus. Now, famous apocryphal gospels include the gospel of St. Thomas, the gospel of Judas, and the gospel of Mary. And we actually talked about the gospel of Judas in that Patreon episode we did on Judas Iscariot, remember? Yes, I do. I love that episode, by the way. Uh, So that's a little bit on apocryphal gospels. Now, Joseph of Arimathea, according to all four canonical gospels, is the man who was responsible for Jesus's burial after he was crucified. So it makes sense that Joseph would be the one responsible for cleaning the body, which is how he obtained the piece of cloth with Jesus's blood on it. The very same piece of cloth that is seen in the chapel of the Holy Blood over in Bruges. Wow. Now, according to John chapter 19, verse 38, after Jesus was crucified, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pontius Pilate and asked permission to take possession of Jesus' body so he could properly bury it. Hmm. 
Pilate agreed, and in Mark chapter 15, verse 46, Joseph immediately runs out and purchases a linen burial shroud, which will come back uh, to us in the next episode, by the way. And then Joseph hightails it over to Golgotha and removes Christ's body from the cross. While at Golgotha, Joseph meets Nicodemus, the Pharisee, and both Joseph and Nicodemus cleans and prepare Jesus's body. And they place the body in a cave from which Jesus will resurrect three days later. Again, just an incredibly important event in Christianity. And a relic from that monumentous event is able to be seen in the Chapel of the Holy Blood in Bruges, Belgium. Now, legend has it that the vial containing the blood of Christ stayed hidden in Jerusalem until the time of the Second Crusade. So roughly between the years 1145 and 1149 when the king of Jerusalem, Baldwin III, gave the sacred relic to his brother-in-law, Count of Flanders, Diedrich van de Elzas. And van de Elzas, yeah. And van de Elzas placed the vial in his family's church in April of 1150. And that's where it's been sitting ever since. Now, there are other stories that say the rock crystal vial containing the precious relic is actually an ancient perfume bottle dating back to, to Byzantium from sometime between the 11th and 12th century. And it likely wound up in Bruges through the sack of Constantinople by the army of the Count of Flanders during the Fourth Crusade in 1204. Regardless, the vial sits in the Chapel of Holy Blood. And we know it arrived there in April of 1150. And you can see the holy relic every Friday and every day from May 3rd to May 17th, when it's put out on display outside the Chapel's Holy Blood, Chapel of Holy Blood's museum. Ah, okay. I want to go see it. And, and really, there you have it. That's, that's my that's first... That's a lot to keep up, though. It's, it's a lot. It's my first soiree into Holy Relics. Um, you remind me of me. You know, I, I didn't <laughs> think about how, uh, how much of a pairing uh, this double feature and mine are... When you think of the history, you yeah. mentioned a lot of historical things that I'm going to mention too, which is really interesting. Oh, okay. Thing, one of the first things I mentioned, um, uh, I mentioned the Byzantine era, for example. I mentioned other things that relate to not the not not the religious angle, mind you, but like how the people were back then. You know how the what uh, were the empires like back then? You know a little bit. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's very interesting. We're we're both gonna fuck up a lot of names is what we're saying that's really what we're saying this is a giant psa as two americans trying to (laughs) fucking foreign correspond these fucking names um i need to take a a sip just go ahead take a sip my my lips were like sticking together as i was trying to and my tongue dried out halfway through this yeah Uh, i don't know how this is gonna sound but fuck i need to drink i need and this is water i'm not even drinking yeah, no, it's vodka actually, but yeah, so, I mean, he tells himself whatever he's got to tell himself, right, folks? Um, I should have no, called. I should have called it. Really, I should have called the break, but we already uh, had to edit quite a few pieces here because I kept fucking up. That's so okay. I, the fuck ups are on the outtakes, so. though. I'm kidding, of course. If they're funny, I put it in. Um, no, that's uh, it's really cool. I, I wonder what. Um, do you want to tease part two or no? Well, there's definitely three or four um, other holy relics that are incredibly popular. You know, in this one, I talked about Jesus' shoes, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. These are really, really popular, famous, mythological sort of uh, relics that I'm going to cover in the next episode. Okay. Um, It's it's pretty, pretty damn cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of a lot of other things that, um, again, have very little or nothing to do with Christianity or the origins of of these famous saints and people but uh, it's just uh, just a lot of lore and a lot of history and a lot of different types of religious um, you just call them what are they <laughs> religious, religious um, I guess the king artifacts no no um, what do you relics Relics, thank you. Uh, oh, man. Holy relics, sorry, holy relics. I kept saying, I went the opposite. I went holy relics is like a synonym to holy relics is religious artifacts. But like, oh, I kept thinking religious artifacts. I'm like, that's not right. Um, yeah, I remember so many other things too uh, out in the world that, again, because of someone's belief or not belief, it means a lot to that person. It means that that person grew up knowing them. It means a lot of other things. And I really like how 
local, you had it, you made, you made it sound how you can go to your local church mm. and find something right. That is, uh, that connects to what we're talking about. And that's kind of cool. That's interesting. I never, I don't think I ever thought of that once. Thank you. Until, until today. Uh, I didn't, I certainly didn't know that, but I never thought of that. Like a lot of churches out there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. You, I'm, I'm sure every listener right now has a handful of them in their neighborhood, you know, their town. Yeah. Right. I have one city. on my block, you know, yeah. it's part of a school, but there's still a whole church there. Exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Bosco, yeah. right? That's what you're talking about? Oh, no, no. That's Bosco was the one I grew up with for sure. The one I went to a lot. But I'm saying in my block today, right now, there's, uh, at the end of it, there's a church there. Yeah. Yeah. If it's Catholic or Orthodox, good yeah, chance. Yeah, it's something. It's something. I don't know what it is. I've never been. <laughs> <laughs> never, never read the sign or anything. I just drove by it. Yeah. But yeah. Mm hmm. Well, good. I'm glad, glad you learned something there. Yeah, I'm learning a lot, actually. Learning a lot. Good. Good. Well, what do you think? Should we uh, call it in? Yeah, should we, call, should we calm your voice and ease, soothe yeah. your vocal cords until next time? Of course, we shall. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's cut it there. Oscar, then take us home. My, egg all over my exterior that was great. yeah upon my exterior <laughs> in hex it means fuck off <laughs> great Are i really wasn't that? trying i i yeah it's just so funny it's our thing yeah it's our thing you know uh i still haven't done it yet but i want to pull a prank with the phone number i just haven't done it yet are you gonna are you gonna let me in on what that prank is? No, because the prank will be on you. Damn. Just wow. Just no, like I'm kidding. That. I'm not gonna do that. The fact that I told you there's a prank coming, that kind of spoils a prank. There's yeah, but how the hell would I even know it's coming? Like it doesn't get like I still feel I would be caught by it. I think it would catch me regardless. Well, yeah, I guess it works kinda of like the way I make that joke where like every tenth or twentieth show when I do the countdown. I go three, two, and then you start speaking, and I say one. Well, oh yeah, yeah. If I wait long enough, that works again. That works every time. Oh, you'll you'll continue to get me. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, but if I do it like repeatedly after every show, you'll expect that it won't work anymore. You know what I mean, maybe there's a time frame where I can, from this conversation till I do it, that the prank will work better. The element of surprise. I, yeah, I workshop all this stuff in my life. <laughs> this is how I live my life. <laughs> this is what I do. This is, this is my job. This is not my job. No one told me to do this. I'm just doing it on my own free will. Uh, but yeah, it's good. It's It has its moments. It's cliffhangers. has all that. Um, yeah. Still don't know what the fuck's going on. Really? In season two? Mm-hmm. Wow. Oh. Mm, uh, yeah. I can't. Is it, like, is it like The Killing or something? No. 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 Do you remember that show? No. Oh, okay. It was a big show for AMC, I think. It was AMC? AMC? I think so. Um, the Killing was one of those shows that made a lot of, I don't know, it was right. It was before or around the time of Breaking Bad. And um, it was one of those huge uh, mystery shows. Like, it's about the killing of this one girl. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's about the police looking for the killer. Kind of like um, that, that suicide show that you liked that I hated. Suicide <sighs> show. 12 days of tapes or 12 13 reasons why yeah that one <laughs> 12 days reasons of tapes. Why. yeah yeah <laughs> i like that <coughs> sorry <coughs> oh fuck okay um and i told you that was what was really extremely annoying is that you know it's just taking too long uh among other things and the killing a lot of people were annoyed because it didn't take until the end of the season two to find out who killed the girl oh jeez. And it was so annoying. What they should have done is that they should have solved it at that season 
and then continue with story with some other thing entirely, but with the same characters, ideally, right? Yeah. They learned that lesson. Seasons three and four are awesome because that's what they do. Um, I see. But it was like, you know, that appeal for that show came from the mystery of the first season. You know, I found a better example. It doesn't remind me of 13 Reasons Why. It reminds me of Twin Peaks. That's what it does. Okay. Man, it's been a long time for Twin Peaks. Did you watch it in the 90s? When it was like new, no, I, mean, I think I'm think I'm I think I'm just thinking of the movie. Oh fuck! <laughs> With no context, that movie makes no sense to me. No, that. yeah. <laughs> you want to hear a funny story? Uh, yeah. Before we go, this is you like this one. It's a I just thought of it now. I can't believe it. It's a, it's a fuck up of mine. You ready? Yeah. Um, for the for um not another movie podcast. The one before that, uh, the the show I had, everything is opinionated. Yes. We uh one point we did because we used to cover TV shows also we just did really badly at it so what we did is that uh we decided to cover Twin Peaks and we went not episode by episode but we would review two episodes at a at a time right yeah and then when we got to the movie what I did was that I downloaded like pirated whatever the movie and everything with it like the bonus features the deleted scenes you know I downloaded the whole thing right and I downloaded the movie. And um, I, I sent it to Jay and uh, Jay, um, Luke and Rob, and we all saw it. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I saw it, and it, and it didn't make any sense. And they're like, I don't think you saw what we should have seen. And we, what do you mean? Like, I think you saw all of the, 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 of the deleted scenes, which is almost a movie length. Oh, no. And I thought that that was the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it probably still didn't make any sense. Right. And it's it's funny because that's how weird David Lynch is, that I wouldn't be surprised if he does make a movie that oh, looks like yeah, that. yeah, right. Right. Which, um, and I'm a, I'm a huge Lynch fan, but that was my first time ever watching Twin Peaks, the movie, and the show. It was our first time, everything. So, like... Um, it was a very interesting, funny time, and we had to go back and watch the actual movie. And like, oh, this way makes more sense. It's still confusing in other yes. ways, but like, it's not as confusing. <laughs> now, did you like the TV series? I did. I mean, up to a certain point. So, um, I liked the first season fine. I think it's pretty great. I mean, it's it's uh, not the best one, but it's pretty great. And then my problem with it had the same problem with the killing. They didn't solve Laura Palmer's murder until season two. But unlike the killing, they didn't wait till the end. They just waited till the fifth episode of season two to solve it. And then after they solved it, they had they had all these other loose ends, so to speak, with the main characters, the FBI guy, for example. Yeah. That they wanted to tie off, and it was ridiculous. And it, some of it was cool, but mostly ridiculous. And so that's why season two sucks in comparison. Even though you do find out who killed her, and it is a cool reveal, who killed her and everything. But like in the movie, I, the movie is actually it's, it's actually a prequel. The movie takes place. Like the week before her murder, WandaVision. Yeah, I guess. You, did you like it? Is that you're saying it in a way that it seems like? Yeah, you liked no, it. I did. I liked it. I liked it. But it was yeah. basically a movie. Yes, I was surprised to hear there wasn't going to be a season two. I didn't know that going into it. Oh, I, I knew that. I knew it when it ended. Yeah, it seemed like an ending. Yeah, but it's supposed to lead into Doctor Strange two now. Well, I, I can see how it does. You know how, right? Because of the magic. That he's all about magic. He's not about science and failed lab experiments, you know, superhero making. He's just all about the archaic magic shit, you know? Yeah. It makes perfect sense that Wanda and him were going to cross paths. Wow. It makes perfect sense. I, I didn't like what they did to Evan Peters. He was oh, just yeah. Kind of yeah, my head. theory my theory got shot down, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, mine too. Yeah, it was a good theory, though. He's more of a red herring or something. I don't know. But, I mean, I mean, maybe like a, a meta in a meta way, it still means the same thing. Like they're getting characters from the Fox days. Yeah, it still means the same thing. But I thought they were doing it as part of the story, and they didn't. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I liked it a lot. It was cool. I liked it too. I really liked uh, Catherine Hahn. She's like, oh, oh, she's great, isn't she? She's great in everything she's in. She's been in a lot of things over the years. Isn't she the one that told, uh, what's his name? C. Riley, John C. Riley, that she wanted to roll him up like a ball and put him in her vagina. 
Uh, was it in a stand-up or something? It was in know, Step remember. Brothers, I think. Oh, I don't, I don't remember that movie very well. I know a lot of people remember that movie super well, but I've only seen it once. Yeah. Um, you know what I remember her most in, or give or take most in, is in um, a movie that no one ever talks about. It's called A Private Life. Hmm. She is. She plays the wife to the to Paul Giamatti's character, and it's about them too. And it's a it's a comedy only technically, but it's more like a drama dramedy maybe. Um, it's it's just a, a the grueling tale of this couple, this older married couple, um, not older, but they're like you know your age, mm-hmm. and uh, they're looking to um, get pregnant, and she can't. She has to take all these other means to like in vitro and waiting for testers, and it's like this the day by day nature of them trying to get pregnant. So like. It's the, the exhaustiveness, the frustration, all the stuff that goes along with it um, is what the movie's about, A Private Life. That's why it's called that. And because uh, you get to see behind the scenes, right? Huh. Um, and uh, she does really good. She's really super. Catherine Hahn is amazing. Wow. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, she's good. I like her. Yeah. I like her. 